It's the Ramble the Ray Stevens Show with special guest Dennis McKenna of the Super Bowl champion Chicago Bears. Now, here's your host, Ramblin' Ray. How about that? Welcome into the Ramblin' Ray Stevens Show. We've got a, a live studio audience here at uh, 22 Creative. Our guest is uh, Silky D. Dennis McKinnon, how are you, brother? It's a great night in Chicago. You know, I, I, they, they cheer like that, and all of a sudden I feel like Taylor Swift or... Well, if you were Taylor Swift, you wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> New book is called Chicago Bears number 85, Silky D Bears All. We'll have all the details on how you can buy this book, how you can find it, how you can get it at ramblinraystevens.com. My first question to you is, is as a kid watching the 85 Bears, um, you know, I was still a little green in the ways of the world, but man, brother, what must it have been like to be an 85 Bear Roaming the streets of Chicago, in my estimation, did you ever have to buy a meal or a drink? And tell me what, what it was like. I think probably for about a decade, we didn't pick up a check. And uh, almost every hotel got, gave us free lodging. Um, <laughs> and cops would pull us over but never give us a ticket. So you know when that happens that uh, you're really royalty in town. How cool. Very cool. want to talk about the Super Bowl shuffle. Yeah, I don't know how many people understand that when they see the Super Bowl shuffle, you're absent from that. Yeah, the old expression, uh, all blacks don't look alike. <laughs> I did not say that for the record. That was Dennis. So when people say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a great Bears fan, and I loved you in the shuffle, say, well, I don't know who you're looking mm -hmm. at, but it wasn't me. You know, and it, 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 every time I hear those first bars, I get upset every time I hear it. It almost, to, to me, would all. It almost is like junior high BS. Almost, I don't want to use the word bully because you're a, you're a, you're a man, you're a football player, you're a champion Chicago Super Bowl bear, but it almost, I mean, it, it's got to hurt. Uh, Willie Gall was my roommate. And oh, is that right? Willie Gall was my roommate, so the Super Bowl shuffle was actually shot at Park West in Chicago the Tuesday after we lost to Miami in Week 13. I stayed in Miami because I'm the only guy on the team from Miami, so I stayed home with the folks. Tuesday is the national off day for the NFL, so I had no reason to rush back on the team plane. Mm -hmm. The lyrics were given to the players that were selected for the shuffle on the plane ride back. But part where it was already booked. Oh. So this happened before we even got on the plane to go down to Miami. So my roommate intentionally kept me in the dark, but even to this day, he still has not apologized to me for it. What would the, I mean, can you, can you cite any reasons as to why you think that might be that oh, way? Oh, believe me, I got a lot more rhythm than Willie. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I mean, you know, if we were to look, and, and again, if we were to look back at, at the Bears 83 through 85, and I believe, if I recall right, you were injured in 86. Took the entire year off. Okay. Um, but your stats were better. You, you, you know, some people talk about, uh, and I'm just going to throw this name out there, you know, it seems like Tommy Waddle. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to get like this. He, he couldn't even get on my bus. But, but here, but you know, when, when people talk about guys that play the slot, you know, a lot of folks talk about little Tommy Waddle. And I want, I want to hear your response to... I, to think I, I think I ran more motion than anybody in the history of the Bears. If you watch the McKinnon in motion, a lot of times, if the guy runs with his man, if he doesn't run with their kicking the coverage backside, his zone, but also is telling Jim where the hot read is. If you look at the Bears in the 80s, we led the league in rushing four straight years. It hasn't been duplicated since. We became a right-handed running team. Peyton only ran towards McKenna, never towards Galt. So th those who really understand sports can tell you that, but that's not sexy. Well, no, let me ask you this. Uh, it, in 1985, what was your playing weight? 183. 183 pounds. And you're out there. I mean, this guy's out there, and you're giving your body up. Mm -hmm. And you and, and I mean I remember you would go out there and, and I mean yeah you could catch the ball but you could block as good as any of the big men. We uh, I was really a lineman playing wide receiver at 183 pounds. But I, I I was always nasty no matter what. But again I'm blocking for sweetness. It doesn't get any better than that. And the Bears needed to have some kind of tenacity on offense where we were just a run left run right Peyton team. Before Galt and I got in 83, we had no passing attack. The old joke used to be in Chicago that the, that the playbook was run right, run left, pass, punt. 
And with Galt coming in, uh, we were able to have better play action because a safety had to roll the top and pay double, open up the middle of the field for me. When you look at the 85 Bears, as a lot of people do, you hear about the vaunted 46 defense. And there was really almost two factions of the team when you think about Coach Ditka yes. and you think about Coach Buddy Ryan. I mean, Buddy Ryan was carried off that Super Bowl field on the shoulders of his defense as Ditka was. You don't see that happen a lot. The 46, in a lot of ways, is a myth in a lot of ways. And I'll tell you why. Take off Richard Dent. Take off Dave Dorison. Take off William Perry, Wilma Marshall, and Mike Richardson. All those guys came in in 83 and 84. Prior to that, who was on that defense? They didn't win. Mm -hmm. So how good were they? Until the right pieces came in here with my class, things did not change. So the defense can talk all the smack they want, but they needed us badly offensively. You mentioned Dave Dewerson. Yes. Um, I, I know Dave was very close to you. And if I'm not mistaken, you are the godfather of his three kids. Of three boys, we came in together in 83. He played at, at Notre Dame. I played at Florida State. And uh, so we actually met in college when I played down in, in Notre Dame at Touchdown Jesus. And he was returning punts. And this is when uh, there was the Olympic strike, 1980. Uh, Ron Stark was our punter. It was supposed to be a decathlon, but they canceled the Olympics. So he didn't have an opportunity to play. And that's the first time I met Dave Durson, you know, and uh, we were fly mates. So whenever we would fly after the game, we get up to the top of the ramp for the plane and the stewards would have beer in one hand, ice in the left hand. <laughs> I don't drink. So I give Dave my beer. He give me his ice, you know, so it, it's it's we were tremendously close. What do you think the players of football and I'm talking the littlest of the little to the Pop Warner high school? college at all divisions and in the pros oh to Dave Dewerson when you see for instance we're taping this on a Friday the Packers game was last night you on any given Sunday can watch players when they go into the blue tent that was never there when you played and no. that is a direct correlation to Dave Dewerson and Dave after he unfortunately took his life giving his brain up to science so we can understand what concussions and CTE do to players. A live brain allowed um, players in the union to actually have a case. The league always specified without a live brain, we really can't tell if there's really CTE um, and concussion situation, and there were. Um, and so I think Dave was the first pebble in the ocean for the league to change policy in terms of safety. And during our days, if if I got hit and walked to the wrong sideline, they would just direct you back to the other t side of the field Put two fingers in your fingers in your face and what, how many fingers do you see? And give you smelling salt. Now they take your helmet, you go into the tent, and you're done. And then the entire next week, you got to go through concussion protocol before they even allow you to practice. And a lot of that stems from the fact that more moms now who have control of where their kids play at an early age. So to me, you want to tell and tell the moms that we're really looking out for your son. Well, today is a lot safer. But if I was able to come through when they really didn't care. It's a lot easier for your kids to play football today. You said, and I, I forget where I read this, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you talk about your mental state today. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've had, you had, you had some injuries, uh, if I'm not mistaken, knee replacement surgery. Two years ago. Which when you think about it, I mean, he heck, man, at, at our age, people can get knee replacements just for the heck of it. You didn't have to play pro ball. <laughs> However, um, you talk about your mental capacity, and it's like you, you said you think – it's almost like you draw, uh, drew a winning lottery ticket. It's not about the money, because the money is only good when you retire quality of life. If you're in constant pain, how good is the money? I'm physically fit. The knee replacement was necessary. It was the fourth surgery I had on the knee. I got tired of the swelling and the arthritic, so replaced it. So it is better now than it was 20 years ago. And am I correct that you gave that knee to your dog for a bone? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking yeah. with uh, Dennis uh, McKinnon. His That's book is uh, Chicago Bears 85, Silky D, Bears All. You'll be able to find it at any of your uh, finer bookstores. We'll also have information on the website, ramblinraystevens.com. Who is the biggest douchebag on the team? <laughs> well, you'd actually have to have a bag to complete that statement. <laughs> um, there, there are some guys that uh, are box office or guys who are fruit fries short of a Happy Meal a few of my teammates for sure. I always thought it was the Jimmy Mack or Steve McMichael. Total entertainment. 
You know, there's some guys that I just don't like still to this day, but they're on defense. So How do you do that? You know, you know, people people always think about team, and you know, there's no I in team, and that's a bunch of BS. However, you know, everybody here in this audience, or wherever we are in life, anybody that's watching, if you work at a corporation, there's somebody there that you don't like. There's somebody you don't get along with, and there's somebody there you you downright loathe. And and I just wonder, it, it, you know, would that have been somebody from the defensive side of the ball? Would that have been a coach? Would it have been the offense? Where where, where did it come from? Uh, with me, if you piss me off, I'm going to tell you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what side of the ball you're on because I know what my position was, what my responsibilities were, and no one can do it better than me. So to me, for us to win, you need me. So you can say what you want to say, but I'm always going to be here. And the Bears did better when you were in the game. Yes. You're you, not shy about that. And it, you know what? <laughs> the bottom line of the matter is that whatever they asked me to do, I did it better than anybody else. Um, but I still don't get credit for it. Why do you think that is? And, you know, I, I know that, that recently, here, the, the first game of the year when the Bears played the Packers, um, I've got it on good authority that a lot of the guys, you know, they were invited on the field and they had good tickets. Somebody told me that your tickets were pretty much crap. Is that, is that a fact? Well, I took a picture of my, pictures, uh, my tickets and I put them on my phone. They were in the end zone. Why? I'm not sitting with drunken fans anywhere. Yeah. You know, to me, you got boxes up that players, especially the 85 Bears, we should have been sitting at. So they, they have a select few guys that they always take care of, but they don't take care of the team. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good acquaintances with Jim, uh, with Jim McMahon. We've, we've spent, uh, you know, we've been on vacations together, and, and he That's always right. tells me that if he needs tickets to see the Bears when the, they play the Packers or the Bears anywhere, he always goes through the Packers front office for that. Sometimes the loyalty is better somewhere else when you yeah. didn't win. That's, I'm not making this up, and Jimmy would back me up on that. It's, um, in a lot of ways, how we've been treated um, is criminal. But it is what it is. I want to talk about Walter Payton. You sat across from Walter in what you call the ghetto. Yes. Is that what you guys call a locker room? This is legit. I mean, and... Uh, I mean, when Kurt Becker would tie a piece of chicken bone onto a string, and he would throw it <laughs> in the ghetto. And that was like, can I come down there? I said, no, you can't. Only the starters are down here. Well, now, Kurt Becker's a guy from, from Aurora, Illinois, man. He's a hometown boy. His claim to fame, he was Jimmy McMahon's roommate. That's about it. That's it, huh? That's Uh-oh. it. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's you know. getting hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's from Michigan. He's not going to mess with me. <laughs> what about, uh, you know, when, when we think about the, the season – and the way it went, and as a Bear fan, you're watching this team do something. You've, you know, most of us have never seen the Bears do, and let's face it, they haven't done it since, which is something. It's, it's really incredible. Um, what was it like, and I know you knew Walter well. It had to hurt him that, that he didn't score a touchdown in that game. Well, anytime you game plan for the Stars, you try to take them out of the game, no matter what. So whatever Walter went, the whole defense went with him. So there was a lot of play action while Willie was very dominant in the first half. Okay. But how many times were we inside the five or in, you know, uh, five yard line where we ran the ball? Matt Sui scored, Jimmy Mack scored, William Perry scored, but Walter didn't. Makes no sense to me, but we all know why. We just haven't said anything about it in 30 years. Number 85 of your Super Bowl Chicago Bears. If anybody has a question, we, uh, we'd be glad to have you up at the microphone. There's a. A rumor going around, and, and you can corroborate for me if you will. And, and I, I, this gets dicey, so if you don't want to answer, it's okay. But I know that you're, I could tell already you're, you're a, you know, it's, it's what it is with you. I'm retired now, so what are you going to do? Exactly. However, there's some people that say that there was maybe a reason that William Perry scored that refrigerator. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, I think Jimmy Max said something about it a few years ago and the fact that he's having issues right now with memory loss and dementia, which breaks my heart, that he didn't get a whole lot of credit t- to the story. But the line in Vegas was probably 50-1 to that Perry wouldn't score. Okay, so you're saying there was a, may- maybe a prop bet. Well, William Perry was not even in the game plan. Timeout was called. Peyton was taken out. William was put in the ball game. Like, the only person that had the power to do that was the head coach. Why would he do that? Oh, Ooh, are you serious? I, I, I don't want to say it. Hey, man, money, <laughs> money always talks. So you think that, that somewhere maybe Vegas played into this? It doesn't have to be Vegas. It's the fact that who has the most power on the team, who can control, mm-hmm. who does what. Okay. You know, and I think from that standpoint, it's total, total disrespect to the franchise in sweetness. Tell me something that 
happened that's so good from 85 that, that you just you think of it every day. I, I, I know somewhere you said when you close your eyes at night, you can still smell a locker room and you can still feel your teammates. I can still see them. You know, and, and I think looking at every year, we almost lose a coach or we lose a player. So what you have left is memories, and they're great memories. And the sacrifices a lot of them made, they don't get the credit. A lot of the unsung heroes that we never talk about, you know, you can have a front line, but what good is the front line if you don't have anybody to back them up? We were a team. You can't single out five or six guys if nobody else existed, which the media in this town has done for three decades. Current Chicago Bears. Yes. Mitch Trubisky. Got a long way to go, baby. Uh, you know, and I want to let's just touch on that for a second. Mm-hmm. It seemed to me like last year, Nagy came in and he let Trubisky kind of play his game. He seems. You know, I know that when you roll out and all of a sudden now it's your best players against their best player, you improvise. There's nobody in the league that does that better than Aaron Rodgers, period. Mm-hmm. This year they seem to want to keep him in the pocket, and it seems that they've put him light years behind where he needs to be. <clears throat> Gadget plays deception is what it really is. A lot of time is a disguise for when you're having issues reading defenses. Mitch is limited in that, and I think from that standpoint – he focuses on one side of the field, one receiver, and he kind of gets locked on. He can't predetermine by pre-snap, similar to an Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady in terms of what they do before they even snap the ball. Um, Mitch is still learning. You know, for Bear fans, you know, we drafted him in the second overall pick out of North Carolina. He only had 13 starts. 13. Who but was the guy that was ahead of him that they didn't choose? Oh, uh, Texan, Houston Texan. Oh, man. I can't think of who that is. <laughs> and then Patrick Mahomes as well. Yeah, but you know what? The Bears are a team when they when they make a pick, they're going to live with it. They're going to protect it no matter what. They'll never admit they made a mistake. I want to throw a couple names out uh, to you before we wrap it up. Jay Cutler. He's the curse. If he was not shown on the field on, on opening night, we'd have won. <laughs> Mike Singletary. Incredible. But it's incredible because who was, who was on his left, who was on his right, who was in the middle. He was always protected. Well, that brings me to Steve McMichael. Yes. Mongo, Mr. Four Horsemen himself. Crazy. He's not, he's not all there. But I love that about him. <laughs> you know, I, I, I worked for years with a guy named John Howell in town. And he was, he was great friends with Dan Hampton. Mm-hmm. And these guys would go out and get so riled up that one night Dan Hampton threw his refrigerator down a set of stairs. Well, you know, you got to know your limitations at the same time. <laughs> That's fine. But remember now, can't run. Yeah. And, and I know that you were – I know you look at – you got to look at some of your teammates and go, wow, some of these guys, they can't walk. I haven't checked up on uh, Fridge Perry lately. I know he's in, you know he's in tough shape. But some guys can't write because their hands are so beat up, mm-hmm. can't walk. It's, it tells you no different than for those who serve our country and protect our borders. They're never the same when they come home. When we leave this game, we're never the same. We leave a piece of our soul, our physical ability, and our mental capacity still there. Is it worth it to you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but you can't really rely on your union. Your union really doesn't look out for you the way they should. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't want a a president of a union who's only concerned about going to court because they'll call billable hours. You need to be looking out for these guys who came through a time where the league really wasn't really concerned about safety. So the things that happened to us 20, 30 years later, we're going to need health care for the rest of our lives. And, uh, and financially, don't act like you can't afford it. Uh, uh, billable hours, that, uh, pay attention to that. Whether you're going through a divorce or a professional football player, <laughs> billable hours is something you need to know. We've got a guy step up to the mic. What's your name, sir? George Rohde. George, your question for, Dave, for uh, Dennis. Love Dennis. the number. Love the number. Thank you. So did I. It is royalty at its peak. Yeah. You're very right about that. What was the worst dress down that you ever got from Mike Ditka? What did you do? What did he do? Be descriptive. Let's see. Uh, As a rookie, I had veteran players at my position that could tell me exactly what day they were going to have a hamstring or a groin pull. At that time, there was no no, uh, MRI machine, so you couldn't see hot spots. So you really couldn't get an x-ray if it was actually a pull or not. And... uh, so being a rookie at that time, we drafted Willie Gall in the first round. Willie didn't show up to week five of six-week two-a-days. And uh, so I was playing X, Y, and Z. And my veteran teammates would lie to me in terms of the route 
and the coverage, and more importantly, the set. So every time I ran the wrong, wrong, wrong route, Coach Digg would be yelling at me. And that time, had, all I had was a tape over my head with my name. So he only, always, it was never first name, just last name. And he'd yell at me every single day. But the great thing about that is I learned all three positions to a point where they couldn't replace me. Great. So it was a blessing in disguise. (laughs) It certainly was. Hey, to uh, Dennis Randall. Dennis Randall has a question uh, from our Facebook feed live. Yes. And uh, Dennis wants to know, what what, what is your favorite, your absolute favorite memory of the 1985 Super Bowl? Not the, not the year. But after the Super Bowl, what'd you do when you came home? I think what he's talking about is the parade, um, what it was like to be in Chicago, those three, four buses moving through town and just a sea of people on such a cold winter day. When we got back, uh, the weather was below zero. We were supposed to have convertible limousines, but it was too cold to get those. Um, so they put us in buses. Now, a lot of us wanted to go home. When Michael McCaster got up and said, well, for anybody who doesn't get on these buses, I'll remember you when your contracts are up. <laughs> so, it's a guy from Miami and zero. That's no fun. So the owner threatens you about me in the parade, and he ran around with the trophy, would not allow us to touch it. And also, even then, we didn't get the love we deserved. But there's a lot of people that, that don't give any love to Michael McCaskey. Well, I mean, the thing about it is... Am I right or am I wrong? It is what it is, you know, and... Uh, but those are, those are our bosses. So, out of respect, we still have to do what they asked us to do. But I think we delivered a championship. They had not particip- anticipated what happened very early. And then when it came time to play the best player, they wouldn't pay him. That's why there was such a big exit in 1987. And it's... And, and that's a wrap on this team. I mean, and... It, it, and it's been a wrap on this team for a long time as to how they treat God the people. put together a great group of guys. Everything aligned in at an average age that year. We were 23 years across the board in our average age. So our best years are ahead of us. Yeah, you, and you were coachable at that time. Coachable, and we were dominant. And almost every team feared us. So you could, you know, you could have ran and parlayed that for the next four or five years. But they looked at it in dollars and cents and not winning. Dirtiest player you ever went against? Ooh. Okay, anybody in Green Bay is the top I mean, of my I mean, Charles list. Martin has to come to mind. But I didn't play with him. Um, um, Joey Browner, um, ran, uh, Keith Millard, Minnesota, um, Lester Hayes, Raiders. Um, Did you ever have to go up against Romanowski, or was he a little bit after you? Well, if he would have spit on me, I would have taken his knees out. Yeah. Um, I blocked everybody. My favorite is still Lawrence Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> so I feared nobody at 183 pounds. One of the guys that made it as a uh, first-round Hall of Famer was a guy named Brian Erlacher. You can't miss him. Uh, Brian's also a friend of mine, but he's on every damn billboard in Chicago with that damn fake hair. Mr. Chia Pet himself. You know, I think, I actually think, I think Brian had that hair. I just think he did the, he shaved it for intimidation. But we got somebody wearing a <laughs> Erlacher, a hair lacquer jersey. What's your question for Dennis? Hey, Dennis, I was wondering, did Walter ever talk about the threats that came to him when you were playing with him? It just came out on the news today, and I was just wondering if he ever talked about it. Well, it's kind of, you know, the statues get unveiled about a month ago. If there were death threats, it took you 35 years to say something about it. How relevant is it today? Yeah, you know, and, and right. to me, when you're going through it, you need the protection at that point. You need to show that you really care about us as players. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me after he's passed. It means exactly. nothing to us. Exactly. I understand totally. Let me ask you this, Dennis. Uh, you know, let's talk about it. I mean, the big R, the, uh, the third rail of uh, discourse in America is, is racism. Yes. And, and you see it everywhere. Um, some of it warranted, some of it not. Anything you, recoll- you recollect from when you played that would fit the, that mold? Uh, black is beautiful. I mean, I, you know, so there's always going to be jealousy. <laughs> I mean, we were coming in here and he goes, age before beauty, and I said, well, get moving. I mean, everybody loves a piece of chocolate. So, <laughs> you know, um, we're always in constant demand. And I think with that, it's, it's, I'm a proud brother, always will be. And, you know, we deal with what's fair. Life isn't fair. Uh, we talk about privilege all the time. But I think at the end of the day, it's stand up for what you believe in. You know, never be silent when you need to talk. Um, defend when you are threatened. Um, when in doubt, call your local law enforcement. 
but never put up with a bully um, and defend the women in your life. Another question for uh, Dennis McKinnon. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jan Jacobson. Hi. Hi. I always wondered if the press did more to kind of hype the relationship or lack of relationship between Buddy Ryan and Coach Ditka. Did you or do you think that in honesty that there was uh, a real strife between the two of them or or did you ever see it? I just wondered. I was always curious because oh, I just thought. They did not like each other at all. Oh, they did not. Okay, good. Absolutely <laughs> not. I mean, the thing about it is the Bears were not winning, and they were not winning badly not winning. Offense was just offense. I mean, we're talking about going back to Bob Avellini days, you know, and, and uh, the defense is kind of all we had. And because of that, Buddy always felt that they were better. I said, well, you know what? The thing about it, your defense might be good, but we're still getting the, the losses until we can com- become a complete team. Show some respect. So we had to earn that. So my guys came in and literally hit them in the mouth and specify how good we were and you're going to need us. You know, and I think with that, they forgot how dominant we were on offense. And they've been patting themselves on the back for three decades, and I'm trying to correct that rather quickly. <laughs> well, you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much. What about – you know, you look at today. I mean, here, we're doing this on, on Facebook right now. It's going to live in the digital scope once it hits my website and once it gets on our podcast form. Stuff lives forever. What would the 85 Bears team would have been like? What would they have been like if we had this and this camera going? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, we, had been, we really had to pay off a lot of people to be silent. Um. So there's been a whole lot of backdooring. Sneak me in, sneak me out. Yeah. Don't tell. Just tell your wife you were with me all night. <laughs> you know, really, because literally, we didn't have to ask for anything. It was given. Right. And even law enforcement protected us. And we, you know, we were almost. You couldn't get close enough to us about how much security we had. Somebody once told me it was like high school with money. Is that is that a correct uh, uh, account of it? No, because high school we couldn't be with the girls. <laughs> you went to a different high school than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. See, high school they're still living at home. See, <laughs> we we didn't want girls who had curfew. What about? And I and I forget. And, and forgive me if I'm off on this. Chicago Honey Bears. What about them? Cheerleaders. What about them? Why'd they go away? Well, uh, fraternizing is not allowed between the lines. <laughs> and uh, as long as Virginia McCaskey is still the owner of the president of the Bears, um, we will not have cheerleaders again. Until there's a sale, you won't see them on the sidelines. You know, and it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. What, when you come to a football game, what do you really come to see? I come to see football. You know, and sometimes I, I, I run into a lot of people say, remind yourself that you're not the superstars here. They are. You know, so when you're trying to talk about equal pay and all this, I say, come on, you know, get over it. That'll never happen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he wasn't in a Super Bowl shuffle, but how about a hand for her? <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> I'm late. I love your candidness. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the world is full of too many guys that, that want to sugarcoat everything. You don't. I love it. I love life. Um, I, God has blessed me. Um, with some great people, and uh, I'm, I learned to be humble a long time ago, you know, and um, I see such sadness in the world, and, and I see a lot of when I see my teammates physically, what they've gone through, and uh, when you're talking about William Perry earlier, yeah. not getting the help that he deserves, regardless of how much money he's made this organization. Sad. Like, you're reminded of who you are when you no longer wear the uniform. Yeah. So here you go, man. It's uh, Chicago Bear number 85, Silky D, Silky D Bears All, Dennis McKinnon, with our friend Chet Kopic. I got to give a shout-out to, uh, to Chet Kopic. Well, I know he helped you write well, this. two things with that. You see those shoulder pads on there? Yep. I wore those. Is that right? That's how much protection we had. Uh, you know, that, that is amazing when you look at it. What about, you know, leg pants and thigh pads? Did you wear any of that stuff? We did. Today okay. they don't wear none Today of that. Today they don't. Well, that tells you they're not hitting. Mm-hmm. And they're not touching. You know, one, one more thing before we let yes. you go. Could you play under these current rules we have right now? Are you I mean, kidding me? Everything is – everything – I can come out of retirement right now. If you can't touch me after five yards – You'd be playing for 40 years. Uh, literally, I just run around, turn to a spot, read the zone, find the soft spot, sit, throw me the ball all day. <sighs> Nothing. Nothing. Even your stars today, they don't play any special teams, which is, a, which is incredible. You're making how much money? You don't play any special teams? Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, so – 
But we went on strike in 1987 and created free agents for today's player. So everything that they have is because we fought for them to have it. All we ask is show us some respect that old school matters. God bless you, man. Thanks for hanging out with us. Pleasure's all mine. All right. Silky D, everybody. <laughs> I want to thank our friends uh, at Augustino's, Augustino's Rock and Roll Deli, uh, locations in Carroll Stream in West Chicago. They set us up with a lot of good food. We're going to go eat some of that right now. Uh, wine and uh, beverages provided by Aqua Vivo Winery. They've got locations in Sycamore. They've got locations in Batavia. And they've got one more location in Maple Park. Stop by, say hi, and tell them Rambler Ray sent you. Also, my friend Amy Kite. Uh, Amy Kite will sell your home.com. Check her out. And, of course, my friends Ryan and the crew at 22 Creative here in Batavia, Illinois. Always really, really good to us. Dennis McKinnon, thanks again, man. Appreciate Pleasure it. All mine. Thank you.